This week's episode was brought to you by Semjeb. If you too enjoy The Whole Rabbit and would like to help support the show, visit www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit, where a donation of just five bucks will earn you access to all our extended episodes, bonus art, Discord access, and I'll even send you a high quality 5x5 five five vinyl sticker of our cover art shipped at no additional cost to you. For our biggest supporters, we have an exclusive limited edition 4x4 four four embroidered iron on barrel bunnies patch featuring the secret logo of our monastic podcast order of drunken templar bunnies this week the extended show is available for free on patreon you don't even have to sign up just go over there visit us and hit the play button you can hear the whole show if you want to so happy halloween thank you and enjoy the show i wish i was a skeleton sometimes they're skinny and creepy and scary and spooky. I like the skeleton dance from Silly Symphonies, so that would be my why I want to be a skeleton, I think. You can just start moving in any direction, in any which way, as a skeleton, and it's just... That's not true. If you're still articulated, you still have the range of movement that a human has. You think so? You think, they, you well, think they're limited by their articulation? They don't have tendons. Yeah, but some of the joints only go one way. I mean, like your hip joint, I guess, in theory, could mostly rotate all the way around, but some of them are only like, you know, open, closed. I wonder what skeleton sex is like. Clanky. Bones. <laughs> like, hey, baby, let's bone. Around the bone fire. You just imagine running up on an orgy of skeletons, just this, like clickety clackety, clickety clackety, clickety clackety. I mean, that's got to be what goes on in the catacombs in Paris, right? <laughs> If I'm there. They're like, no, everyone get back in your place. Don't mess up the pattern this time. Mari, if you were going to be a supernatural creature, what would you be? A werewolf. Oh, that seems like oh. a no-brainer, huh? So I was going to guess, probably. but, you know, I try not to assume things. Or a fairy. Mm-hmm. Oh, but yeah. probably, probably both a dog, werewolf, fairy thing. No, oh, we're going to talk about that today. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome <laughs> to the whole rabbit, where we don't just rob little innocent children of their milk duds to give us offerings to our elder deities, teeping houses and burning down the abandoned ones. No, we venture into the untended wood behind the Chuck E. Cheese and go snooping for fairy doors that we might gain access to the underworld and meet the Pumpkin King himself, because this week we're discussing Halloween. Sowin. Sowin. Sow woo! Um, this week I'm joined by Mari Sama, the Queen Woof. Mari Sama. A woo! Hello! And Gosselmer Lights, the propitiator of priceless pieces of poetic um, knickknacks. Hi, Gosselmer Lights. <laughs> Just, I'm like the clean version of that, like, garbage creature at the end of the labyrinth. I, I make things out of this, the garbage I have. I don't just put it on my back. Happy almost Halloween. Happy Sawoo. I, I liked, what was it, Sawain? I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, m- middle road that, you guys. Middle road that. Yeah, you know, how do we pronounce this stuff? Let's uh, let's get that out of the way. Is it Sawin or or Sawin? Sawin. Sawin. Yeah, the person I saw that was saying Sawin was uh, very British. I just liked it because it was funny. Out of all the languages I've ever had to bash my head up against just reading, I think Irish and Gaelic and the whole Celtic trip of language is the most frustrating. Yeah, it's really confusing. I feel like there's just a bunch of extra letters in there for them to say while they're still thinking while yes, they're talking. Yes. It's like blah, 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 blah. And they're, you know, it just keeps making noise and then they get to the word. Yes. It, yes. It's, uh, it's it's the opposite of German. There's like no silent <laughs> letters. You just sound them out. Even the long ones. Yep. This one is just like, that doesn't look anything like how you say it. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what letters are for? Well, talk to the French on that. Yeah, let's you talk know, to the they, French on that. Let's do they it. Put, they put extra letters in theirs too. The fuck are they thinking? But they gave us all the food we like, so we let it slide. Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, I give you that. Like freedom fries. No, no, that's all American, yo. <laughs> I, I, I think that the Irish are just like rebels to the core, so they just completely refuse to Romanize. Even they're like, yeah, we'll use your alphabet, kind of. Well, the Irish weren't conquered, really. No, they they eventually agreed to like 
kind of cooperate. I hear the IRA finally disbanded, air quotes. Yeah, they're, they're an interesting people. Do y'all ever listen to the Cranberries? Oh, yes. My dog's name is Zombie. Do you, people sing that. Concept? Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Samhain is a festival of Gaelic origin, marking the end of the harvest season and the commencement of winter, or the darker half of the year. Fraser in The Golden Bow mentions it's the time of the year when the cows would be brought down from their summer pastures and slaughtered. So as a pastoral people, it was a time of critical importance, opposite to Beltane when the herds would be let out to graze again. But while yeah. Beltane celebrates the living, Samhain honors the dead. My mom's birthday is on Beltane, and I've just enjoyed reminding her every year of my life that that's one of the biggest pagan holidays. And it's the fertility one. She's like, I know you've told me. I'm like, I'm going to tell you again, though. Do you ever just burn anything in her backyard? Just yes. But we lived in a rural area, so that was not weird. No, I think you're doing it. Mostly correct. So, as the Celtic day began and ended at sunset, it was traditional to celebrate Samhain from sunset to sunset beginning on the 31st. Christendom would later simplify matters by making November 1st All Saints Day, followed by All Souls Day on November 2nd, redubbing the proper night of October 31st All Hallows Eve, or Hallowmas, in which vigil was known as Halloween. And while nobody but the clergy gets to dress up in fancy robes and on hollows tied, the sentiment from old Celtic traditions is not dissimilar. Prior to Christianity, it was custom to light bonfires, which were thought to have protective cleansing power and set out offerings, not just to propitiate the dead, but most importantly, the Aeshi, who, if left unheeded, would claim family members or cattle throughout the harsh winter season. Whether or not they came in clouds of pixie dust, smokeless fire, or UFOs is not mentioned. I thought that was interesting. The beginning of wearing costumes uh, happened on Hallow's Eve, or Hallow Even was the, one of the names that they had for it. And the clergy would dress up as their favorite saint because it was um, All Saints Eve or All Hallow's Eve. So it really was, uh, that wasn't just a joke. Then the clergy were the ones that got to dress up. Right. They, As they, were usual. Encouraged, they were encouraged to portray their favorite saint because the, that All Saints Day was a designated for saints that didn't have their own holiday in the Catholic Church. You just show up dressed as Herod. I mean, you could if they didn't have their own day. Did they have to not have their own day? It, it could be. It's all saints. Of, it's everybody. Right. Yeah. Is that kind of where the like, was that them trying to pull in the like dressing up to ward off evil spirits? or like, see, all the saints are here tonight. Probably. Fuck off, devil. What's the day after? What's the name of it? All Souls Day. All Souls Day. Correct. OK, okay. so that's the that's the actual day that the church designated for mourning your ancestors. So that was the last day of Hallamus was the All Souls Day. So and when I was looking at the having the breakdown of like the entomology, it was Halloween, like with the apostrophe in it. I think you said Halloween. Is yeah, that like I tried to conjugation of it, like we're Halloweening. But like Halloween, that, that's how I kind of read it. It's I'll be honest, I don't. Verb. It's Hallows Even. Hallows that, Even, as in the oh, night okay. before All Hallows Day, All Hallows Day, All Saints Day. <laughs> so okay. we learned in our yeah. demonolatry episode that when you sing a song to your demon, it's called an N. And I presume mm. this is an older, okay. fancy, schmancy word. So they were probably all singing songs. So it's the the caroling. The, yeah. These people were called solers. Or, mm -hmm. Oh, we'll get to that. It's called, it's called souling. Yeah, it's it's kind of like that's where trigger treating came from, but it's also where caroling com comes from, which is crazy. It's just crazy is it, it it's it is like Nightmare Before Christmas. Like, in fact, Christmas stole everything from Halloween. Yeah, it, it was kind of hard to deny that they were all just the same thing. It's like, oh, OK. Well, for Christians, part of celebrating the holiday was exercising a demonstration of charity. So a lot of people mm -hmm. would go around door to door performing to get money or food. Some of the research I was doing that they called it um like the begging times, like it was the begging season. Around Halloween, was, right? Yeah, but it ended. It was like you can beg from now until this time and then that's it if you didn't get it then come see me next year <laughs> and now it's yeah. like the dating season it's kind of the same thing oh that sounded personal so who are the aoshi because we just said that that's the night they come out and that's such a fancy name it sounds like aliens so i mean they could come in ufos 
I did suggest there's, that was a possibility. They're spirit people. Well, some scholars speculate they're the old pagan gods or deities of the past. Well, others claim they're the elder race from whence the fae come and they're in some way related. Also gnomes, goblins, trolls. You All know, my favorite elves, people. Everything. Favorite people. All the things. <laughs> I might actually be a little bit troll. Probably. I think my DNA test confirms that. I'm just a fairy. Yeah, same. They're not really directly named the way we did. They're oftentimes referred to as the good neighbors, the fair folk, and they're understood to inhabit the other world through subterranean access by way of fairy mounds, which typically are oriented with their frontal portal toward the sun during the autumn season. There's much fear and respect regarding these mounds, as is understood that even cutting brush, especially white thorn, around them may result in death, as the inhabitants of these worlds can be quite particular. I wouldn't fuck with them. <laughs> well, they're the guardians and the tricksters of nature, and they come from burial mounds, which indicates that they're kind of like they haunt graveyards. I mean, it's like the beginnings of that um, spirits in the graveyard myth. Yes. This is what's so fascinating to me about this episode is that I went and looked one thing after another that we just, you know, randomly associate with Halloween. And it almost all goes back to Ireland. Yeah, they they remained independent, though. Even when Rome took over the British Isles, they couldn't get uh, parts of Scotland and Ireland was completely free for a long time until the United Kingdom came about. Well, didn't they actually have to like go over there and be like, OK, please just like be a part of our 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 empire clearly yeah, but we're they, not gonna win this one will they you didn't, they didn't sign up though <laughs> like i know their um their version of the church kind of really went its own way didn't it like it has its own kind of lore and assimilation with the culture something cool about the all hallows have mass or hallows mass both anglicans protestants and catholics all appreciated the holiday so pretty much everyone in England and the Associated States would would celebrate it. It was pretty ubiquitous. Everyone had their version of it. It was really just like deciding when the assimilated culture was going to celebrate it. Right. Uh, the stories that remained in the Irish culture because they would eventually bring it to America. Yes. In their folklore. Mm -hmm. Now. I found this fascinating that Aleister Crowley and his teacher McGregor Mathers, before they like left, well, before Crowley left the Golden Dawn and went to go do his own thing, there was this really big like rave uh, about Scottish culture and having a Scottish lineage. And so they took Scottish or Gaelic names to themselves as magicians and they made a big thing about it. And that kind of comes off as like some funny, dopey thing in the story of Aleister Crowley. But actually, once you learn a little bit more about the burial grounds and how the elders uh, inhabited the underworld there, you could see how they as magicians were like, oh, this is just like ancient Egypt. This is part Part of this ancient magic yeah. culture and and that was like their way of being like well we're not egyptian but we still could like pretend we hail from some mystic you know race was their idea i think this is what i'm getting out of it just from reading about it scottish burial mounds i find very interesting up in like orkney and stuff they definitely had a more established like a very specific idea of their afterlife kind of it did seem parallel to egyptian like i can see how they got there Got my Reese's Pieces here. I want some. Sit. Ah, uh, woof. The idea was is that the dead would come out of these fairy mounds, okay? Because that was the day when the veil was the thinnest between the two worlds. Same thing at Beltane. So presumably it was around the equinox when the day and the night are equal. And on this day, when the spirits could roam about, what was assumed is that they would go back to their old houses or their old quote unquote haunts, right? The old place where they would mm -hmm. hang out or that they liked. Then you'd place out food, silverware, their favorite toy if they're a kid with the hopes of appeasing them that they wouldn't try and take something or that they wouldn't like, I don't know, get mad or mess with your cattle or your kids. The idea was if you didn't give back to the spirits in the form of charity, you were going to inflict a uh, bad fortune on your own self and your family. So a lot of children would start dressing up as spirits or deceased people or ancestors to get uh, the pittance or they would come around and be like, oh, well, I'll pray for people in purgatory if you give me this, uh, if you give me a soul cake or whatever. 
Mmm, so cake. Mm-hmm. And they were little uh, spice cakes, like cookies. I did like how the Christians kind of are the ones that started a lot of what we know as Halloween and night. Wasn't the soul cake kind of part of their thing? Yeah, it was uh, mostly in Britain and parts of Scotland. All the soul cakes I saw had little crosses cut into them. Like the Eucharist. Yeah. Well, it's funny. It was like mostly the homeless and the kids who'd go around asking for the cakes. But they'd have to like pray. Yeah. They'd have to like pray or sing or do something or humiliating. A lot of people wore costumes and did presentations like a little act or a magic show or a fortune telling. So a trick for or a treat. A little play. Exactly. <laughs> they did the trick for the treat. It wasn't necessarily the other way around. I like the cultures where it said it kind of started as almost like a pagan protest to the Christian takeover. They just put on masks and go like, that's where like the mischief end of it came from. They're like, we'll just go mess with them. Yeah. And they started, but then they, would, they started including St. Nick and that's when it transitioned to Christmas, I think. <laughs> They're like, if we send a saint with them, then they can't be evil. So Banshee comes from Banshee and refers to a female member of the she who announced the death of a family member by wailing and screeching at a person in their dreams. I've even heard stories of modern women having these dreams. They'll call into shows like Jim Harold's Campfire and they'll give a story about uh, a woman in old tattered clothes who's kind of spooky and just screams at them like up close in their face throughout the night. And anytime they fall back to sleep, she comes back. And in the morning, it's usually a family member that has died. Oh, yeah. It's a bad omen. And it's funny because it is traditionally one banshee is attached to one specific family. Like, it's not just like all of an Ireland thing. Like, I, I'm super Irish. My mom is on both sides of my family. I'm super Irish. But yeah. from my mom's side down, all of us women in the family, we do have dreams. We know when someone's going to die in the family. It's like someone's about to. And it's like, oh, there it goes. OK, so that's, that's the thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My mom, she's super Christian, but she's like, but I do know when people are going to die, have dreams about it. And in the more recent years, I've started having experiences when people are going to die that I know and love. So it's a real thing. <laughs> now, there's another one who has a name like Banshee, but I think it's Beyond Ni or Ni. I can't pronounce these words. And she's a washwoman who's seen washing the bloody clothes or armor of a person who's doomed to die. Then the Lenan Si is a fairy lover. There's also a cat she and a coo she, which is a dog. In fact, a fairy dog. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds so cute. I think of the dog from Coco. But what was the second one? The washerwoman? Yeah, she, you, she's if you see an old nasty woman washing the armor or the clothes of somebody, especially if it's covered in blood, that person's screwed. Like they're dead. They're is, doomed to isn't die. that isn't that one specifically to die in battle though? Probably. I didn't see that. I, know, I, know. I don't have that. But oh, no, I'm just I mean. from my like lifetime of previous research. I think I remember that one. I think it's a safe assumption. This is a funny word when you see the word she because we're getting to the cat she. And when you look at the word, it looks like the word Sif. If you just sound it out, it's Sif. So on my notes, it looks like it says cat Sif. And furthermore, I thought about this a little bit, how Aleister Crowley and McGregor Mathers were part of this clandestine secret order and they gave themselves these like weird Scottish Irish last names. And then you find out that they were doing this because they wanted to think of themselves as descendants of this ancient race, the Aoshi, right? Which is spelled yeah. Sith. And then any Star Wars nerd will know that for some reason, all the bad guys in Star Wars like to associate themselves with an ancient mystic race called the Sith. And they give themselves their own like little magical name based on this language or idea of the Sith. But you never actually see these things like who are they? Where are they? Right. And the only time like even at the end of the film, when you eventually find the emperor in his lair and, and you see these quote unquote Sith, they're all just like in a giant burial mound, basically. They're like mummies. Yeah. So this is where we find out that Star Wars has just been like Sam Haining the word Sith. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> that, yes. Like it's almost a one to one comparison when I saw I was like Sith. And then I thought about it and I was like, you know, if there's any commentary about Aleister Crowley and relating him to Anakin and just like that whole idea of the Sith, like it seems like dude knew what he was talking about. He, that was a really clever thing to throw into that world because it's, it's 
It's like our world. You know me. I love to relate everything on the show back to Star Wars. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that'll that be the next thing that George Lucas changes in the next re-release. Well, I don't think there's anyone that thinks that's boring or that's an uninteresting part no, of Star Wars. I, I, Everyone wants to know more about the Sith. Perhaps. I, I find Mari's it funny like, that, I don't care. You know, I, I, do, I don't Star Wars. I full Harry Potter over here. Uh, Voldemort was in that one Star Wars movie. That was cool. Snoke. Uh, Snook. Yeah, whatever that guy's name is. I so, was like, oh, look, Voldemort's here. So let's get to the cat Sif, or as you could say it more correctly, the cat she. So the cat she or fairy cat is a dog-sized black cat with a white patch on its chest, said to be native to the other world. It was a common belief that the cat itself was actually a witch, transforming herself, a power that could only be used eight times, for on the ninth transformation, it would render the witch a cat forever, which gave rise to the superstition of cats having nine lives. It was traditional to leave out a saucer of milk on Samhain for the cat she. Otherwise, they might become offended and be which your cattle from producing any milk throughout the winter. You know, it's funny how many tie-ins I'm seeing to Howl's Moving Castle because, yeah, the, that's a big thing. He keeps changing into a bird and Calcifer's like, you're not going to be able to change back soon. Oh, it's like that. One cultural tradition associated with cats in the Scottish Highlands includes their distraction and separation from the dead prior to a funeral. As it was believed, the cat was able to abscond with the soul of the dead prior to its reception by the gods. As such, there was a guard who presided over the body all throughout the wake, including the late night hours, where its primary responsibility was distracting and playing games with the cat to prevent it from stealing the soul of the beloved family member. To accomplish keeping the cat away, fires were lit in every room aside from the one where the dead body was placed in hopes of making every other room more cozy. While games and catnip were common fixtures as it was also custom to sing entertainment songs to the cat and tell it riddles without offering it an answer as to bedevil and perplex the feline to keep its mind off its proclivity for stealing the souls of the dead. Yeah, no, this, this is just their polite way of saying we got to keep the cat from eating their face until we bury them. Yeah. Cats eat faces. But I like the idea of telling a cat a riddle. I feel like it would sit there and try to figure it out. Like the cat's like snooping up on the dead body, trying to eat the lips off its like former owner. And then the guard's like, oh, now you little kitty. I, I, eyeballs. What, what's yeah, the airspeed eyeballs. velocity of an English swallow? <laughs> no, I just want to watch Sad Cat Diaries. But yeah, that's interesting. I, I like that they made a thing of it. No, so fires in each room's a good idea, though. Cats be like, it's warm in here. Yeah, they don't want to go near the, they don't want to go in the cold room. You don't want the body to get all stinky either, so you just keep that room cold anyway. Oh, I guess they probably did that all year. I was going to say if it was winter, hopefully it wouldn't be, you know, decaying that fast. You know, that had to really mess with people. I know they had to, like, sit up with the dead thing, but, like, there's still decomposition going on. Like, in funerary rites, you you puncture all the internal organs. That way, they, like, gastric germs don't just build up and the body explodes. But I bet without doing that, there's just a lot of body movement still going on there. Spooky. Gas is coming out and stuff. That's going to mess with people. So there was also a practice called Taheim, where they believed the demonic Kate she called big ears would appear and grant any wish to those who took part in the ceremony but the ceremony required you over the course of four days and nights to burn the bodies of cats i don't have anything polite to say that's That's interesting well the tradition of laying waste to cats uh on this holiday is a thing even though it's a bad thing we're not saying to do it but well because they would they would roast cats in hopes of getting wishes. That's true. They like that they is, thought it was. A, I had not heard that. They before. thought it was a service to God to remove a black cat because it was considered a spawn of Satan or like a witch or a shapeshifter demons type thing. Mm-hmm. That is sad. Yeah. In, in a weird same, way, though, do you think that's where the like kids and fireworks and animals on Halloween night? Yeah, transition probably. To? That's weird. It explains it right. to some degree. It's not like kids are reading up on Irish history or anything, but it's weird how patterns do emerge that way. I learned something. Thank you. So now we move on to the part where Mari should perk her little ears up because we're going to talk about the Kushi. Okay. This is a dog fairy and it yeah. has paws as big as a human hand. It's usually green and shaggy and it's said to hunt the rocky clefts and moors of the Scottish Highlands. Go ahead. There's also on the wild hunt there is some and then uh, the hounds of hell like the hounds of the Baskervilles are also considered one an Aoshi. It sounds adorable. Well any kind of dog that's like a fairy dog. Yeah the, the word the fairy dog I'm like I'm sold 100%. This one specifically in my head has become rather goat-like, though, because of the green and the... 
anyway, their job is to retrieve the souls of the dead, technically, or to herd cattle or whatever happens to be in the hunt at that point mm. to go after the fox, if you will. So in this one, it's said to hunt silently, but it can let out three large howls and it can be heard by sailors all the way out in the ocean. It's also sad to say that if you hear all three howls, you're doomed to die of fright. So after you hear two, you have to get out of earshot, which sounds kind of impossible. So it's, it's like an animal version of a banshee almost. It's usually considered an omen. Is it also pro- uh, to guide the souls back to the afterlife? Like all everyone that died, they're like, come on, everyone, we're going now. Mm-hmm. In Welsh mythology, the Cwn Anun was Arwen's hound that accompanied him on the wild hunt and is sent to portend death when seen. But in some mythologies, Cwn Anun becomes a psychopomp and guides the souls of the dead to the other world, not unlike the Greek Hecate or Hermes. You know, I find that really comforting. If like something's going to guide you to the, like the other side. I would want it to be a dog. I'd feel better. So it's said in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland that the she folk can induce female dogs and horses to attack their human owners. The way to render these hounds harmless in such cases of fairy possession is to either take blood from their ears or to collar them with a garter. There's also an evil uh, bogey spirit that can make the dogs basically leave your side. It can summon your dogs and make them like disappear forever. Ooh. And I found multiple stories of a dog owner who encounters the fae in disguise or is pursued by a supernatural being only to release their dogs in defense and have them return without any hair often bloodied and close to death it's commonly believed that dogs are capable of seeing inhabitants of the other world naturally i've heard that story yeah returning hairless and beaten up apparently it's pretty common there's lots of stories of like you're talking to somebody and then all of a sudden they get really pushy or they get kind of supernatural and you're like oh i'm talking to a she and then you're like oh get them dogs and they get in a fight with the dogs and they get away but if they ever get their dogs back which usually they don't they don't have any hair left i I believe they would do that like shave it stealing all the hair for their evil i mean i've always heard dogs see ghosts and stuff well they can also detect terminators that makes sense you know it's funny a zombie believes in ghosts and not like zombie sees ghosts but he believes in ghosts and so all, all the time like the heater like i have one of those little space heaters he thinks that thing's the devil or like things will come on and he looks at me he's like mom there's ghosts i'm like no baby it's just he's like no there's ghosts and he just legitimately believes it won't calm down i have turned off yeah I'm like you're so sweet baby so yeah, dogs I don't know if he would see a real ghost or not he hasn't had the chance so dogs play a critical role in the concept of the wild hunt as a comparative theme running throughout various northern european cultures uh was first presented by jacob grimm as in the grimm fairy tales in his 1835 publication deutsche mythologie depending on what region you are in and what culture you belong to the wild hunt was led by various figures which include odin king herod and even krampus what is the wild hunt well, think of Johnny Cash's Ghost Rider in the Sky, but in Northern Europe, instead of the hellish red-eyed cowboys and their horses, it's the king of the fairies and his white-bodied, red-eared hellhounds set loose upon the world, chasing down murderers and criminals the way their victims had been chased. Usually hearing or glimpsing the wild hunt pretends war or a battle, but at best might mean the death of a family member of the seer. Some even speculate this is where the idea of the witch's Sabbath may have come from, or at least informed the idea. Oh yeah, I like, I like that connection. I like how we have a modern wild hunt in America. But yeah, it's definitely out to get sinners and people that are doing bad in the world like criminals. Okay, so the the righteous don't experience this then. Unless they're headed in the wrong direction, I'd say. Like a Christmas carol style? Like, let me scare you back on the right path? (laughs) Probably. Well, the problem with the wild hunt was if you were not conscious or not aware, you would just go up in it and involve yourself in the wild hunt and start chasing along or parading along with them. Mm-hmm. Mm. I, I can see that, especially if it's supposed to be geared towards the ill intended. They'd be like, Whoop, let's go do some bad. And then it just flips on them. Even war itself is a little bit like that. You're like, oh, here we go. Off to war, you know. Groups are always more dangerous than individuals. Like, have you ever met a crazy Uber driver? Says the Uber driver. (laughs) Like, have you ever got in a car and they're just pissed off? Yeah. That's because they're on the wild hunt, too. They've just got, like, that evil glint in their eye and their heart is racing and their palms are sweaty and just every little piece of the input just makes them angrier. And the fact that they even have to say hi to you snarling through their teeth when you get in the backseat is like, uh, you 
fucking packs. Get in the car. You just, no, you can't touch my radio. No, I'm not going to talk to you. Ugh, as they rage down the freeways and dash through the city streets on their endless crusade to make two dollars an hour. Yeah, those people are on the wild hunt. I synced it. A giant rat race, except IRL. But it's like you lose yourself to it. That's the important part. Yeah, it's like a prison. For your mind. Just like Makes marriage. Just like marriage. <laughs> it's a prison for your dick. <laughs> Traditionally, at least in the highlands of Scotland, the wild hunt was led by Gwyn Op Nude, or the King of the Fair Ones, and ironically had a blackened face. He features an Arthurian legend and fights Gwythir every May day for the hand of Arthur's sister, mimicking the Holly King mythologies. He typically can be found roaming the other world or on Wynn, where it is his responsibility to look lord over its devilish inhabitants lest they invade our world and literally kill everyone so he's kind of important according to speculum christianti the 14th century manuscript against divination wealth blah, 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 welsh soothsayers would invoke gwyn's name before entering woodlands proclaiming to the king of the spirits and to his queen gwyn up nude you who are yonder in the forest for love of your mate permit us to enter your dwelling so the fairy king has a ghost dog with red ears instead of a red nose. Eat your heart out, Jack Skellington. And his dogs will fuck you up. They will fuck you up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think Faye implies, like, they just win by default always. Jack-o'-lanterns, I thought were safe. But no. It also goes back to Ireland and the Samhain Festival. Um, one pretty straightforward uh, thing about it is you basically pull it out of the ground, core it out, stick a light in it, and then uh, cover it in spooky faces. But it's uh, uh, traditionally a turnip, actually. A turnip or a mangle wurzel, which is now the name of the podcast, by the way. <sighs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to the whole mangle wurzel. Mangle wurzel. The mangle wurzel. Wurzel? Is there a Z in it? Yeah. yeah. Mangle wurzel. Well, well, just make it just mangle wurzel. So you carve spoopy faces in it. And, and Mango then, pretzel. Mm, now I'm hungry again. Gross. And then <laughs> you run around scaring people with the pumpkins or the jack-o'-lanterns. And they're supposed to represent, uh, well, at least to the Christians, or the faces of the souls stuck in purgatory following their redemption on All Saints Day. Uh, yes, but the story is about a man named Jack. They got stuck t technically in purgatory or on the um, ghost plane. Oh, really? Oh, really? So it was, there was a, I was going to ask if it was connected to Spring Hill Jack. He, he was like a trickster, boogeyman type spirit legend like don't do that kids or spring Hill jack will come get you i mean possibly related i like um, the originally was a turn up though because i was like how's moving castle again yeah <laughs> uh so like apparently um this is based on a will-o'-wisp ghost which is you know the in the graveyard you'll see like a floating mm -hmm. light or something so this is supposed to represent the lantern um that this man named jack holds uh mm -hmm. as he wanders the uh, nether planes throughout eternity so he's stuck between realms basically is the story because the devil comes and tries to take his soul in his life he's like a trickster he's a swindle he steals things and he's dishonest mm -hmm. and um so the devil comes to take his soul and he tricks the devil two times to get out of going to hell and on the last time he tricks him he's like okay well my i uh my last request is that uh i can never go you can never take me to hell and so the devil agrees and then after a while you know, he dies of old age or whatever Jack does. Mm -hmm. And uh, he goes to heaven to try to get in and they won't let him in because he was a sinner his whole life and never repented. And then he attempts to go to the gates of hell and tries to get in there. And then Satan comes up and is like, uh, no, we had a deal, dude. Like, you can never come into hell, remember? Like, so this guy gets trapped uh, between heaven and hell as like a specter to light his way uh, towards purgatory which is why the little, you know, the kids going souling, they would uh, offer to pray for those in purgatory. This is like kind of relates into that because he's stuck in purgatory with a lantern, only a lantern to guide his way made out of a turnip that Satan gives him out of pity. <laughs> pity turnip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pity, and then, pity turnip from Satan. Satanic right, pity and, turnip. And then when the Irish came to America, they're the ones that started carving pumpkins because they're a lot easier to carve than turnips. Yeah. So the name of the band is Satanic Pity Mangle Wurzel. Smashing turnips. Smashing Satan turnips. You get a lot of alliteration going on there. Mangle Wurzel. 
Mangelwurzel. <laughs> Smashing Mangelwurzel. Smashing Mangelwurzels. I've seen videos since Magic Pumpkins went to Germany. They just kept throwing pumpkins at them. They're like, ha ha, funny. We get it. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, you know English. Great. Good job. I like that that's how they went with that. They're like, we've got pumpkins, you guys. Let's give them some. We have Smashing Pumpkins for us. Smashing Pumpkins. It's funny, y'all. I, I just like picturing like the shit eating grin on Satan's face when Jack came to be like, so can I come to hell now? And he's like, no, 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 remember our nah, deal? <laughs> nah, <bro>. nah, man, <laughs> here's, nah, here's, dude. Here's a turn up. Have fun. <laughs> Can you play the nah. Glockenspiel, spiel, bro? No? <laughs> Get the fuck out of here, man. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good one. That's got to suck. That sounds like nightmare fuel, just not being able to go to either forever. Like, ugh. You better have yeah. this fucking pocket bong ready. <laughs> Maybe that's what the turnip is. He just gave him an apple and was like, here, make a pipe out of this. I'm sure somebody's apples. done it. Dude, do you know when the Romans invaded the British Isles? Okay, they didn't get Ireland, right? But um, a lot of the British people and Welsh and some of the Scottish started to incorporate Christianity, right? First, they did the pagan stuff. Mm. So the Roman goddess of the hearth or like the harvest, I mean, was Pleorma. And she was her sign or her sign was an apple. What was her know, name? Like for the harvest season. Pleorma. That's almost like Pleroma. Almost. But uh, that's where bobbing for apples comes from, because that's they would do that during her festival in Rome, in the Roman Empire. So that's kind of incorporated into our harvest festivals because of them meshing with the druids and the pagans up in that's cool you know in the british isles i love bobbing for apples it's pretty fun i i, look, I like it very much it's like doing a magic trick it's like i might drown but i bet i won't jazz hand so from what i understand there was usually an element of apples or nuts and there was divination happening all at this time and some of these traditions came over to the united states with the farmers but it really wasn't until the irish came that it became a thing right because the puritans didn't celebrate any holidays associated with the church at all like the pilgrims and the shakers and the quakers they're too busy killing the natives and raising barns and making pies yeah because they don't even uh typically do like birthdays or anything too right exactly birthdays are a satanic holiday probably i don't know according to the satanic bible anyway let's ask the satanic bible self-serving holiday it's the last page, yeah. I'm pretty sure. It says, if you're looking for a <laughs> satanic holiday, start with your own birthday. Uh, my, mine's dead duck day, so I'm happy with it. You can just sell the ducks you kill? I don't have to kill them. They kill themselves. Started, They just ran into a window, and I'm like, yeah, birds do that. I'm going to release this show on Devil's Night. And from what I understand, the origins of Devil's Night go back to Mischief Night. And the first mention mm. of Mischief Night is in 1790, when the headmaster of... Uh, some school I can't pronounce encouraged his school play to end with an ode to fun, which praises children's tricks on mischief night, quote unquote, in a most approving of terms, quote unquote, again, to make it very awkward. So it well, came up. It. It, yeah, it's like a, it. I don't know. It's it, it basically got made up in the UK like around uh, 1800. It quickly got out of hand, though. So. Yeah, this guy just incited like a student riot and was like, you're yeah. adorable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was like at the end of the play, they have this thing about Ode to Fun where they're like, oh, mischief night, the children play so many tricks. I don't know what the song was like, but there's something like that. And then it was that thing, okay? And the UK, in the UK, they would play all the pranks like on May Day. But then it shifted to later in the year. Or, um... All Hallows Eve. It's yes. the night before it. Everyone was going to mass that night. But sometimes they would do it on the night of November fourth because of Bonfire Night. Right. Mm. Like after every after the the Hallowmas, they would do it during uh, Guy Fox. Yes. Yeah. Which also kind of lines up with a uh, Salon. Yes. Yeah, so it would it be after instead of before. Remember, the remember. To do it in. The 5th of November. <laughs> Mischief Night sort of took a turn uh, when it moved from the UK to Detroit in the 70s. And, and it started listening to Motown and then it became Devil's Night. So and then to the regret of lawfully aligned character sheets everywhere, young Detroit hooligans and reprobates would peruse the streets, setting fire to the abundance of abandoned buildings and homes that followed in the wake of a city crippling recession. It's not uncommon for years of economic downturn to see a rise in arson incidents on Devil's Night in Detroit, leaving me to wonder how it will do this year. Hmm. That's going to be insane. Now, they have a tradition of 
people walking around patrolling the streets, making sure that their abandoned buildings and such don't get burned down. Like it's a thing. Like it's like a battle against good versus evil, you could say. That's Which taking it a bit far. The tool of the evil is the light. <laughs> Jack Pumpkin is an angel of light. Mari's got the freak nick though. <laughs> We asked Mari off air, though. She's never been freak Nick, so we won't. Uh, no, I don't understand. All right. Well, I will explain it. But in <laughs> order to hear the explanation, you're going to have to pay me at least five dollars by going to www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit, where for what I said earlier, five dollars, you'll get all our extended shows, the bonus artwork we have. And I'll send you high quality five by five vinyl sticker of our cover art. And if you subscribe to our higher tiers, you will not only get all that stuff, but you'll get a four by four embroidered iron on patch that says barrel bunnies on it. And that pretty much means you belong to our strange uh cult dedicated to the goddess Ostara. I don't know. Let's just see what happens. You put the patch on yourself, you'll get all this extra magical energy, and if you decide to get in a fight, you'll probably be able to punch like one or two extra times. I don't know. I haven't tested it, but you can by going to my Patreon. Also, there there are pictures of the Freak Nick in the Discord, which you get from joining the Patreon, so... Do that. Thank you, Gosmer Lights. That is included in the five dollar tier. Yep. And that patch actually looks really, really cool. I can't wait till Lang gets here. I'm excited. You know who designed it? Me. <sighs> and this he's not lying. The, the stickers are super high quality. Also made by Mari, right? So one of them or some of them. Well, Mari the art. limited edition eat carrots, shoot laser stickers that were gigantic and expensive to ship have run dry. So anyone who has them, they're pretty rare. The rabbit Sophia Babylon Baphomet bunny. That's that's mm-hmm. all me, baby. Or that's actually not me. That's my muse. Because I don't want to take credit for it because I can't draw that well. But I was sitting there and I tried to draw Baphomet and it came out like how a two year old would draw Baphomet. And then I was like, wow, I can't draw. And then I sat down later and I tried again. And then this other thing happened and it definitely wasn't me. And it was the bunny Baphomet. And that's the whole rabbit logo thing for the podcast and if you want it in sticker form just get the patreon it's mostly about just giving me money because i just i work a lot on the podcast even though it's really do yeah also i like to call it the bunny fomet oh so cute the bun <laughs> fomet. that's its name there we now. go the bun fomet oh that sounds like oh no, bunny fomet like the easter bunny <laughs> bunny fomet bun, bun fomet sounds like the easter bunny though like i like it <laughs> bunny fomet's four syllables so so it's going to have to be that. Oh, I I can't syllable. I'm sorry. I don't. That's never a skill I acquired. Bunny Fomet. Well, yeah, but I, I'm also like cat. That's three syllables. So no. Cat. <laughs> Apparently it's one. So I failed that, that test hard. But yeah, that thing's great. Mari's our pronunciator. Mari, can you pronunciate the uh, the thing I want you to say next? Oh, like eat carrots? And shoot yeah. lasers. 